Welcome to Inspire Campfire, a podcast where ordinary people tell their stories of extraordinary adventure. These are campfire stories meant to inspire the rest of us to light the fire within, get outside, follow our dreams, and return to tell our own stories. Ready? Let's strike the match. Welcome to the show. I am your host, Scott Wurzbacher. Today, I am super excited because we're going to talk about lifelong goals and turning passion into purpose. Our guest is Paul Martino, and he recently completed a goal that began 30 years ago, and that was to run a marathon in all 50 states. For me, it's a reminder that stories like these are all around us and often closer than we think. Paul is my neighbor. I could probably throw a stone and hit his house. I see Paul running through the neighborhood all the time, but I didn't know about this epic goal until I saw a social media post about him finishing number 50, and I feel pretty confident that he saved the best for last. But we'll get into that shortly. Paul has spent 30 plus years as a physical therapist. He's the youngest of seven boys, and he loves to travel. He has completed 88 marathons and ultra marathons. He also notes that he has dabbled in professional eating, <laughs> which I suppose explains why he runs so much. But, but for the last eight years, Paul has been at the helm of Let Me Run, a nonprofit wellness program that inspires boys to be themselves, to be active, and to belong. He is also the chief running officer for an organization called Destination Marathons that creates VIP travel experiences for runners. Paul has figured out so many ways to turn his passion into purpose, which is something I think all of us aspire to do, and I cannot wait to share his story. Paul, welcome to the campfire. Thank you, Scott. Glad to be here. Thanks for uh, interviewing me and talking to me. I'm excited about this. Um, just one one brief correction. I did let me run from 11 to 2019. 11 to 2019. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Well, and I definitely want to get into that because that really was a great example of uh, turning passion into purpose and, and doing what you love and helping other people in the meantime. But, you know, I, I think we'll just go ahead and spill the beans right now because the, the, those of you that are watching can see Paul's shirt. And uh, it says Tino, Tino's Hawaii Five O. So Paul Martino, nicknamed Tino, and uh, <laughs> you can guess where the final marathon was run in the great state of Hawaii. And I can't, I can't wait to hear that story. But, but Paul, let's let's go back to the very beginning. And uh, can you just tell us where this passion for running began? Well, um, funny thing is. I think it may have even started before I was a runner. You know, I was mesmerized by the Olympics. And I remember being about 14 years old, working in a caddy shack, caddying with my buddy. And we both loved the Olympics. And uh, he said when he grew up, he was going to be an Olympic basketball player. And I wanted to be an Olympic marathoner. And I wanted to do winter and summer Olympics. And I wanted to do the Olympic cross-country skiing. Nice. Um, well, I wasn't even a runner yet, but I soon became running and, uh, I have yet to go cross country skiing. So, um, <laughs> never made that in the Olympics. And I was only probably about an hour short of making the Olympic marathons in, uh, in running. But, uh -huh. um, so I soon became run, uh, got into running and, uh, I just loved it. And, um, the harder I ran, the further I ran, you know, you know, your body releases endorphins and people don't understand that feeling. But um, I like running to the point where the body doesn't want to go anymore and you just keep going. The body doesn't want to run anymore and you just keep going. Man, I mean, now we're hitting the deep stuff right there. Can you just talk <laughs> about that? Like the body doesn't want to go anymore, but you keep going. Yeah. And you know, I've I've done a few, as you mentioned, ultra marathons. The longest mm -hmm. I've run is 56 miles. Wow. So, um, yeah, there's just this point, you know, you heard about the mythical wall, which is at um, usually somewhere around 20 miles um, in the marathon. And that's where all your glycogen stores are 
are depleted um, depending on how you train. You know, some people hit the wall at mile two, but that's because of bad training. Um, but the more you train, the better it is. But when you get to that point where um, the body wants to shut down um, and you just push beyond it and your body can go beyond what you think and go, you know, I've read that when the body, when your body wants to stop, you're pretty much about 10% at the level of what your body can handle. So mm -hmm. you need to go beyond that point. And uh, it's just a thrill when you, when you push beyond what you think you can do. And in my journey, you know, we'll talk about, you know, we'll touch on the 50 marathons, the 50 states, but each separate marathon presented a different challenge and a different goal. And sometimes it was time-based, sometimes it was completing based, sometimes it was about, well, most of the time it was really about the relationships and the people I was with. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think like so many people talk about that wall and I'm glad that you brought that up to begin with. Cause uh, you know, this whole podcast is about that voice inside that calls us to adventure and then, you know, the, the roadblocks that we experience along the way and how we get over them. So, you know, we do hear about that wall and, and I'm really glad you like, how, how do people get over that wall? And, and why do people get over that wall? Um, it's just will. It's willpower. It's um, it's desire to achieve. I mean, everyone sets a goal. Um, maybe some of them, it's just to finish. And that body is shutting down and wants you to stop and walk. And, you know, it would be great to crawl into a bed and, and take a little nap. But that's not why you're there. You're there to finish. You're there to achieve your goal. And a lot of times you run these races and you don't achieve your goal. But the important thing is, what do you learn in that race? And, you know, I've done the 88 marathons and ultras and probably a thousand races, but it's not necessarily achieving your goal that day. What do you learn from it? And uh, we'll talk about it. But it took me 12 years, 14 marathons to qualify for the Boston Marathon. I like to say, and it's a, a phrase we use in let, we use in Let Me Run. It's called failure is only failure when you fail to try again. Mm. So, uh, you know, you heard the saying, you get, you get knocked down, you get up again, you know, it's just that willpower. So you go beyond what your mind is telling you it, it needs to stop and people just a desire to go. I mean, that's no matter what you do in life, whether it's running or whatever it is, you got to just push yourself to get, to get where you want to go. Failure is only failure when you fail to try again. Yes. I love that. All right. So, so at the wall, um, and I don't mean to harp on this, but I just, this is something that we talk about so much. Do, so first of all, 88 marathons and ultras, do you still experience the wall? Oh yeah. 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 And, uh, in Maui, the, it came out probably about 14 miles. See in Maui, we started five in the morning in the dark. And it was still, it was already 72 degrees. So it was tough conditions. It was high humidity. It was windy and it was 72 degrees. Um, and then on the West coast, the sun really doesn't hit you until it gets over the mountains. You know, it's light out, but the sun didn't hit me until about 14 miles. But when I got to 20, um, my body wanted to um, shut down. And that's when, that's when you just start thinking about the positive things. and. And on that day, I just thought about all the amazing memories of this journey that I that I uh, experienced. And I think about individuals and different groups of people that have helped me along the way. So, yeah, I um, even yeah, like I said, so even in April, this past April, I felt that wall. So that and you kind of went there a little bit, but I was just kind of thinking to myself, like, what, what, what does the self talk sound like? What, what are you, what are you saying to yourself when you hit that wall that that helps you get over the wall? What does it sound like inside your head? Um, sometimes it's just it's a mantra, uh, you know, simple like just keep going or mm -hmm. you know keep keep moving forward, keep taking another step. But a lot of times. And this is what I what I've I've done in marathons. So I have uh, in my family, I have my wife, my daughter, and my son, and my dog. And uh, you know my dog. I do. <laughs> Our dogs are friends. Yes, yeah, they're both Britneys. So um, the last four miles, which are always the most painful miles, I dedicate one mile to a family member. So I try not to think of the pain, 
I try and think about that family member and anything positive. Sometimes the last mile could be my dog. Sometimes that last mile I dedicate to myself and I mm -hmm. think about, you know, things I've accomplished. I love that so much, Paul. That is awesome. Um, the, the dedicating the miles I, I did, uh, I mean, I'm nowhere near the, <laughs> the runner that you are, but I did a half marathon this past fall and it was sort of a comeback story from, um, having some back trouble for a while that I had to rehab. And for that half marathon, I actually wrote down a bunch of names of some people that had helped me recover that from the back pain and included yeah. like, you know, my, my, uh, uh, personal trainer and some, some other people that had kind of helped me along the way. And, and having those names on my arm as I was finishing that half marathon was, it was super helpful. I just, I love that you pointed out that you dedicate those miles to your family because it, it is inspiring and it is encouraging and it, you know, it helps you feel like it's about something bigger than just you. Oh, always. It's always something bigger. I mean, you know, and people have done the 50 states faster. They've done it faster times in a shorter span, but it's really about the why, the purpose. And, um, and for me, family and friendships have, have mattered and they've been part of the journey. And I know from previously talking to you, like family was a huge um, impetus for this whole thing. Like family was kind of at the center of this, of this goal that you created. It was, and you know, uh, and you hit on it at the beginning. I like to travel. My family likes to travel a lot of times through the years I've had as a physical therapist, I worked in the school system. So I have, I've always had some time more available in the summertime. So we had a van, a minivan, like most families. And, uh, the day after school, we would usually throw everyone in the van, Tyler and Morgan and, uh, Marie and I, and we would travel to different places. And, uh, sometimes it included a race. Sometimes it didn't, but we wanted to experience. And the whole idea of this 50 state journey was to see the country. You know, everyone wants to see the world, but I want to see the country. So, um, so that's what I did 26 miles at a time. I wanted to hit every state. Sometimes I was in and out, but those were the, the least fun states, you know, when you just go there, I've done some solo states and that's not what it's about. You know, that seems like a chore to just go there by myself, run a race and get out. Um, so then it was about family trips. And that's part of the reason why it took me 30 years because you can't take that many vacations. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, a short I, period of time. It's awesome. I mean, it's almost like you used the running as an excuse to travel and to spend time with your family. And that that is key to spend time with the family. And, uh, and the goals have changed during the years. When I, my first marathon was in 93. So I got married in September of 92, came back from my honeymoon. And my friend and I, that's when the journey started in September of 92. Okay. We said, okay, we'll run one marathon. So we started training for the Charlotte Observer Marathon. Nice. And then after that first one, you know, of course I said one and done, and that lasted about two days. And, <laughs> and then it's like, okay, let's qualify for Boston. And um, the next marathon, I missed qualifying for Boston by um, 17 seconds. Mm. I was told I could write a letter, and I, I didn't want to do that at the time. I'm like, no, I can just run another race and I'll qualify. Well, 12 years later, 14 marathons, I finally qualified at the, at Myrtle Beach. And uh, a funny story, you know, so a lot of my memories now, since I did these 51 stories, it brought up so many more memories that I didn't really think about. So, uh, and then the Maui experience was amazing. So on that day I qualified at Myrtle Beach, my kids were small. They were whatever, they were like uh, six and eight years old. Okay. And they got up real early and my wife dragged them all over the course and I qualify and I'm emotional and, uh, you know, I'm screaming, I'm yelling. And I remember I was interviewed by a local news station and they tried to interview me, but all I could do was cry. So I don't think the interview went anywhere. But that night we go out to dinner. I remember Maria and I are sitting there and the two kids were in a booth and the two kids are zonked. So they're just sleeping in the booth. I look back at that moment now 
you know, living that whole experience yeah. and then living Maui and seeing my kids at Maui that are now 26 and 24. I look back at that moment and I say to myself, it was, I was telling Maria this, I say, I'm looking at these two children sleeping and I, I say to them now, I say, that's right, kids, get your rest because it's going to be a long journey and I'm going to need you in Maui. Yeah. And I'm telling you, when I was in Maui, those yeah. kids, my wife, my two kids and my daughter's boyfriend were there and they were all over the course. They elevated that experience. Mm. And it's just funny looking back at these two kids sleeping in the booth. And yeah, they needed their rest because it was a long journey and I was going to need them at the end. That's so funny. Like, come on, get ready, kids. <laughs> So, all right. So you said it took 12 years to qualify for Boston. That's, yep. that's a story right there. Um, but then you just said, Oh, Oh three is when you set the goal. So, all right. At what point did you like, talk about that? Like what, talk about the moment when you actually decided, all right, this is a goal. I'm going to run 50 marathons in 50 States. I ran my first three marathons in the early nineties. And then, um, and then life got in the way. I did. A, I got back into race walking. That's a different story. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I had my two kids, and they were babies. Um, and the funny thing, dabbled in professional eating. I entered a chicken wing contest. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I I throw that in just as a joke. I did, but I did eat seventy chicken wings in eleven minutes. Oh my! God. Seventy chicken wings in eleven minutes. Yeah, that's a feat. So uh, so I won money. So I called myself. I called myself a professional eater because I won money. Um, <laughs> I love it. Paul, I'm thinking cool hand Luke right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so then a friend of mine, I didn't run another, you know, state, new state for five years. And a friend of mine who moved to Dallas, she wanted to qualify for Boston. So I flew out to Dallas and I ran with her, got her to qualify. So then I started running another marathon one time a year. And then in 2003, I started hearing about people that go after 50 states. Mm -hmm. So I ended up running that year. I ran in Florida. Uh, I ran the Chicago Marathon, Illinois, and I ran a marathon in West Virginia. And I said, OK, I'm going to do this. I don't know when I'm going to do it, but that's my goal. So that was 03, 10 years after my first marathon. Yeah. And I just put that goal out there. And I never really had an end date. You know, I toyed, someone said, you got to run 50 by 50. I'm like, okay, if maybe, but that didn't happen. So when you, when you made this, when you made up your mind, this was a goal that I'm going to go after. How many marathons did you have under your belt at that time? Um, so in 03, when 03 ended, I had run 11 marathons in eight different states. I had right. eight states then. You had eight states. All right, yeah. here we go. 42 to go. Let's do this. So, so let's talk about some of the different marathons, uh, some of the different states, and and some of your favorite favorite uh, memories. Well, kind of just randomly out of order, but 2013 was when um, I did Alaska. Nice, and it was it was an eight day or ten day trip with the family. You know, a lot of times I would. There's a website called marathonguide.com, and I would spend hours on it reading about different marathons all over the country and the world, really. Um, and I would read about marathons, and I'm like, this is the marathon I want to do. And it may be seven years before I get to that marathon, but that was the marathon in the state. So when I read about um, the King Salmon's marathons in Alaska, Cordova, Alaska, a really remote town, you got to take a ferry there. I read there were 12 people in the first race and every runner got a van escort to protect you from bear and angry moose mama. And I'm like, <laughs> Oh, of course that's the marathon I'm going to do. Yes. So that was probably, I read about it probably in like, Oh eight, And I finally got to it in 2013. And then there were 36 of us in the race. They drove us out this old rail trail bed and they drove us 26 miles out of town. And the race director, she dug a hill in the dirt road and said, run back, go. And uh, it was 26 miles with 36 people in the race. And it was totally remote. And uh, there were 
mountain range and glaciers on the right and glacier streams coming on the road and the delta on the left with all kinds of birds and it was just so peaceful and amazing i did not see any bear or angry moose mama which i'm glad about because nice. at the start i asked her i'm like where am where's my van escort and she goes oh there's too many of you we don't do that anymore <laughs> and i ran 24 miles by myself i mean by myself so uh the cool thing with that race my my wife and kids ran the 5k and that started later so they were getting out of the bus when i had three miles to go and i saw them and they got out just in time to high five me as i ran by yeah um so that was a cool trip because it was a family vacation you know we did so many amazing things but it was also um a little bittersweet well, very bittersweet because that also corresponded with the passing of my mom mm. so she was dying in that summer her dialysis she, her kidney failure and she was on dialysis and um things were going bad so i had visited her four times during that summer yeah and i remember right before we went to alaska i visited her for the last time you know knowing that it's most likely going to be the last time yeah so um we had an amazing trip and i was told during the trip that she was stopping dialysis and it was just going to be days and uh we landed in charlotte late at night and my brother called me in the airport and he said paul i'm going to put the phone next to mom and it's time to say goodbye and so i said my final words to her and uh within you know we got home and an hour later my dad called to say she was gone and so i'm glad i got those final words so yeah that was probably the most exciting trip of all of them but you know it's the memory of my mom but my mom was awesome she raised seven boys and nobody worked harder than her yeah a lot of uh, a lot of attachment to that memory oh yeah for sure That's cool you know i think one thing just worth noting i mean for me like when i think of a marathon i think of you know boston and chicago and 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 the and the charlotte marathon here i mean thousands of people right yeah. and you're up in alaska running with 36 people and i think right. that, that that's cool that you found that kind of marathon and yeah. uh and targeted that kind of experience for for such a remote place yeah the funny thing is half of them came from st louis if that group didn't come it would have been a lot smaller <laughs> that's, a, that's too funny okay well so what are what were a couple of the other states that you really enjoyed you know a couple of them are obvious you know colorado and utah absolutely incredible and it was it was more of a trip you know than the marathon and a lot of my marathons were more about the trip so when we went to colorado again with tyler and morgan the race was on saturday but we were going to rocky mountain national park first we were focused on climbing flat top mountain which is over thirteen thousand feet high yeah so we did that on thursday morning yeah and um so we're hiking all day you know up and down we probably started at six in the morning and we were told to get back under the tree line by noon because that's when the thunderstorms start and just after noon it it started and thank goodness we were down so that was like a seven hour hike or whatever eight hour hike of you know going to thirteen thousand feet and back um so two days later saturday morning i woke up and i could hardly get out of bed i was just so sore i mean every single muscle in my body was sore and maria said you're going to be okay i'm like yeah i'll, I'll get through it so uh, <laughs> so i mean again i kind of loosened up at about mile five and uh, you just keep plugging along you know talking to people because even if i don't know anyone i'm going to talk to you um until you run away from me um <laughs> a good distraction to have people yeah so uh you know, I met different people. I meet people at all the races. I I get energy off of people. So yeah. uh, so that whole trip was absolutely amazing. It was unique that, you know, I kind of wrecked my body. And uh, Utah was another one. Tyler couldn't go. So it was just my wife and, and Morgan. And we went down to Zion and Bryce mm -hmm. Canyon and yep. spent six days hiking, you know, up and down mountains, incredible trails in the heat. And then the last day of our trip, I ran a marathon. Um, so of course my body was was pretty was pretty beat up, but uh, but it wasn't about it wasn't really about the marathon. You just 
click it off, you get another state, you get another incredible experience. I mean, the races were incredible, yeah. but the experience of doing that vacation with my family was far more memorable. Yeah. And the true reason of why we're doing it. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's a huge purpose behind it. And that, and that whole thing sounds like in the 30 years it's evolved because you've taken on more, more causes and, and, and things that you've been involved in. I definitely want to get into, but Paul, I know like when people are listening to this, they're going to want some context, like talk to us about the, the, uh, the, the marathon times that you're running. Okay. So, um, my fastest is a 307. Oh, okay. Um, when I first started running, uh, the Boston marathon qualifier was for my age, which was under 35 was a 310. Wow. So the times have changed right now. Yep. If you're under 35, you have to actually break, uh, three hours, I wow. believe. Or, and as you get older, you get a little bit more time. Yeah. So right now, as a 56 year old male, my qualifying is a 335. Yeah, that's amazing. So um, can we talk about Boston just for a second? That's some the one that everybody knows. What 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 was that experience like? Uh, incredible. Um, so Boston is. I mean, it's my favorite marathon because what it means because it's. The one marathon that an amateur has to qualify for, you know, they are, there are charity sp spots and thank goodness people run for charities and raise money for great causes, but to qualify, it's the ultimate, it's the ultimate goal for the amateur runner. So, like I said, it took me, uh, 12 years, 14 marathons to qualify in 05. And, uh, so I, I remember when I did it, it used to start the first time in 05, it used to start at 12 noon, and then they've moved the start back to 10 a.m. But I remember um, it's another moment when I cried at a marathon was standing on that starting line and knowing how much effort and pain I've gone through to get there. And uh, I'm just at the starting line. This, it was already a blazing hot day. And uh, just standing there, ready for the gun to go off, with tears down my face, and uh, incredible experience. I cried with joy when I qual. I mean, they're all tears of joy when I qualified in Myrtle Beach, and then I cried again at the start line of Mer uh, of the Boston. And then after I finished at Maui, when I knew my whole dream was complete, I uh, I sat on a stack of ice. And I bawled my eyes out again. But Boston, getting back to Boston, that's what you asked about. Yeah. It's, it's just incredible because it's the epitome of an amateur runner. And it's a very tricky course. Yeah. I, um, I consider myself one in five against the course. I've only beat the course one time. And that was in 2016. Because um, it goes a lot of downhill. And then at mile 16, you start climbing. And then you hit the Newton Hills. And then eventually Heartbreak Hill. But that first marathon, I have three distinct memories. The first one is the kids handing out oranges the whole way. <laughs> um, it's just it's just incredible. And then the girls of Wellesley, I don't there's a there's a right at the halfway point, Wellesley College. Okay. And they call it the Scream Tunnel. And when you are a half mile away from the Scream Tunnel, you hear this shriek in the air and you're not sure what it is. And as you get closer, it's the girls of Wellesley that are screaming so loud that their voices travel and people stop and they high five, hug and kiss. I don't know if they kiss anymore with this whole COVID thing, yeah. but, um, but there used to be a lot of kisses going on. And then, um, and then the other thing is cool. When it started at 12, it coincided with the start of a Red Sox game. So okay. people would make makeshift scoreboards along the way and they'd update you with the Red Sox. Score. Oh, that's hysterical. Yeah. See, the thing with Boston is you run through seven small towns to get to Boston. But, I mean, Boston fans are like, they are hyped. There's, yes. I mean, most like New York yes. fans love their New York teams. Yep. New England fans love their Boston teams. But on that third Monday of April every year, when you run the Boston Marathon, you are actually on their team. Yes. So they're, che they're cheering for you like you are one of their professional athletes on their team because the Boston Marathon is their marathon. Yes. So it's just a unique experience. It's such a great city. I mean, I love it there, but, and I'm just, I'm just kind of, 
thinking about that from your standpoint, I mean, 12 years to get there and the emotion that you talked about, I mean, so what was it like to cross the finish line at Boston? Well, I hit the wall pretty good. It was a funny thing. I met this, uh, there was this guy from Charlotte that I never spoke to. And we actually stood together um, at the start line, Bob Nixon. And uh, we said, what was your qualifying time? We Our qualifying times were within 10 seconds of each other. And we just said, okay, let's run together. I mean, we cool. I saw him in Charlotte, but I never spoke to him. So we ran, you know, pretty much 20 miles together. But when I got to Heartbreak Hill, it was it was a pretty warm day and and I was depleted and I fell off the pace. So when I got to uh the finish line, I was in I was in bad shape seeing white dots and and doubles, and I actually sat in a wheelchair briefly. Uh, eventually met up with my wife who came to see the run. She was at, she was right before, before the final turn. So she was at mile 26. And, uh, and I remember I went back to the hotel and I laid down for a couple hours and we went out to dinner, but I still couldn't eat. And we were at a bar at probably 11 o'clock at night. And I had my food in a box and I had the bartender heat up my food. Cause that was when I could, the first meal I could have. You started feeling um, better, yeah. Yeah, I started feeling better. Yeah. So that that was that was pretty cool. And of course, in Boston, you walk around with your medal, and occasionally a bartender will give you a free drink. I love it. Um. So yeah, it was pretty cool experience. Great experience. Okay, so let's go to Hawaii. Let's talk about like was that did so over the course of the thirty year goal, like at what point did you decide Hawaii was going to be number fifty? Probably about 2003. <laughs> so it was always, so more yeah. or less, it was always the Yeah, goal. it was always the last one. I'm like, yeah. I don't know when this is going to happen. Yep. Um, I don't know how it's going to happen, but when it happens, I'll be in Hawaii. That's awesome. Um, and I did, a, you know, like I said, I read about different marathons and, and I just put it out there. The funny thing is, is I never had an end date. And uh, we talk about Boston and what it means. So. I'll tell you on how I got to the end date. So in 2017, a group of the crazy leggers, my, my running friends, uh -huh. we all went to this marathon in North Carolina and we were all going to try and run a qualifier to, uh, to run Boston. Well, if you ran the fall of 17, you would apply the fall of 18 and you'd run it in the spring of 19. Okay. So you're literally qualifying a year and a half in advance. So we all went there and we all ran our Boston qualifiers and I beat my qualifying time by four minutes and seven seconds. Nice. Um, and I still had no idea when the end was. So at that point, uh, what was I? I think I was um, 2017. I was still 17 marathons away. So I ran this race. I qualified by 4.07. And I'm like, oh, I got that. So in 2019, I will run the Boston Marathon. Well, then the fall of 18 came along and there was a mad rush trying to qualify. And the qualifier, you had to beat your qualifier by like over five minutes. So I didn't get in. So then as we were moving into January of 19, that's when I started like, okay, I'm not running Boston. I can run in April, I can run Arkansas and Kansas, and then I can plug some more marathons in June. So that January of 19 was when I set my end date. At that point, I had 13 marathons to go. So I was going to do seven in 19 and the final six in 2020. So with, if I qualified for Boston that year, I still may be chasing 50. Yeah. Um, by, but by not getting in, that was the catalyst to make me figure out, okay, I can do these other races. I can start knocking out States. I can forget about Boston for now. And, and it was game on. And it was the first time I ever set an end date. And then 2020 came along. I had six more to go and, you know, COVID struck. Yes. So that was the first time that, that I felt the weight of getting it done because it was like, when is this going to get done? Because I finally put an end date and now I had the pressure of, will I? ever get to the end right yeah 
with all that going on. I mean, you said you had 17 left in 2017. So I'm just looking at set. I'm, I'm looking at 17 marathons in five years. That's, that's a lot. <laughs> it may should have happened in three. Yeah. That's pretty <laughs> cool. All right. So take us to Hawaii. Um, and for listeners, what Island were you on? We were on Maui. So it was Maui. the Maui marathon. Okay. So really cool thing, really cool thing happened. So here's my Maui medal. Nice. It's a 50. It is a 50. Because it was their 50th marathon. Oh, my gosh. How cool. So it I was love that my 50th, the their 50th, in the 50th. In, so, in uh, the shirt that says Tino's Hawaii 5-0. Oh, yeah. Yep, yep. <laughs> and then, oh, can I show the back, Scott? Yeah, can absolutely. Yeah, We're yeah, going to yeah. look at the back for, for, for listeners. The can back, you, it says. You see it? Team Martino with a big old 50. It says 50 states on the yeah. back. Love yeah. it. And yeah. the whole family was wearing these shirts. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so we got there um, Thursday, did a bunch of fun things. This race, though, it was about the race. So I wasn't going to go crazy hiking. Yeah. So um, they did a lot of fun things. I kind of stayed calm. And ma marathon, like I said, marathon started at 5 a.m., and it was a point-to-point -point course. So the first eight miles, you run to the coast. And then the final 18 is all along the coast, which was mm -hmm. incredible. Wow. One part was kind of rocky, and it was up and down, hillier than I anticipated. And then, like I said, after mile 14, the sun came out. It was over the mountains. And those last six miles, it was in the high 80s. And it was, um, it was pretty darn hot. Maui is so gorgeous. It's absolutely one of my happy places. Oh, it and I can't beautiful. imagine yeah. what a better spot to do number 50. And and I I said my team, my team, Team Tino had these shirts on, and I could see them a half mile away. And it was just, it was lifting me. Like I said, when they were little kids sleeping in that in that little uh restaurant, yeah, in the booth. I needed them to rest then because on this day they came out. They these guys were up at 4 a.m. and they were on the course at 5:50. And when I saw them for the first time at mile eight, they were screaming top of their lungs. My son was playing a, a different theme song every time I passed them. They were cheering for everyone. They lifted me up that day. That they elevated that experience as much as I was excited about that marathon. It was better than expectations and my family made it that way. Yeah. I mean, I, I love the support and the encouragement. I mean, that's just like the whole family coming together for this, for this common goal, really to, to get you across the finish line and complete yeah. the goal. I, so I'm curious, I mean, a 30 year goal, 50 States, 50 marathons. What, what was the emotional experience like coming across that finish line? It was the ultimate. I mean, it just finally, because I said I felt the pressure of finally getting it done. So, and then you never know leading up to it, you know, because Hawaii was one of the toughest states mm -hmm. with COVID restrictions and they relaxed them. And then we had a new wave of some type of COVID that was coming back. And I just wanted to get it done and, and made sure every, all five of us were healthy when we got there. Um, so, as I'm approaching the finish line, I see the orange shirts and my daughter's the first one and she puts a Hawaiian lay around my neck and I hug her and then I hug my wife and I'm high five in uh, my son, Tyler and Max. Um, and then as I'm approaching the finish line, you know, everyone's cheering, but I'm, you know, I'm, I, I'm a little bit of an extrovert. So I'm getting the crowd screaming and I'm excited and I'm screaming <laughs> back at them. And uh, they did announce my name. They say Paul Martino from Charlotte. And there's a funny story. I crossed the finish line. And, uh, you know, after all that screaming, the blood is drained from my head. So I'm like, oh, my gosh, I think I'm going to pass out. But there was a person who actually coached Let Me Run. She lives in Charlotte. She heard Paul Martino from Charlotte. <clears throat> and she ran to the finish line. And she said, Paul Martino from Charlotte. And I just fell on her. And I'm like... <laughs> And she's like, do you remember? I'm like, I remember you. I know you. Just stand still. So that was pretty cool. Um, and then my family showed up, you know, seconds later. And they had a bottle of champagne for me. And uh, I popped the cork and we're spraying champagne over everything. And we do have a funny picture because there was, um, 
in the first aid tent, they had like a stack of probably 50 bags of ice. Yeah. And I laid down on the bags of ice. And that's, <laughs> it was like a little couch <laughs> of ice. Ice yeah. bath. I love so that. So I was just chilling on that. And, uh, and that's when, you know, this was probably about 10 minutes after the race and I'm sitting there. And that's when the wave of motion came over me. And I'm just, uh, it was funny because I'm like, I'm, I'm hunched over and I'm crying. And there was a woman with her family and she asked my daughter, is he okay? And she's like, oh yeah, he's fine. He's just very emotional. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I mean, as you should be 30, 30 years and it comes together here. And I mean, this most beautiful place in Hawaii, I yeah. mean, just what a, what an awesome journey from start to finish. And so I guess, I mean, I guess the next question is like, now that you've completed that goal, like, how does it, how does it feel to have completed it? And is there any sort of like, sometimes when we complete these major goals, there's almost like a feeling of letdown afterwards. I'm just curious if, if you've experienced any of that. You know, so many people have asked me that, Scott, and not at all. I am just overjoyed. I'm relieved. And it's this morning there was, you know, today's global running day. and. Uh, I was given a gift today on that. And there's been so many celebrations. It's like, it's been like six weeks now, right? Since I've done it. And it's like enough already. Let's move on. Let's, yeah. let's move forward. Um, but not a letdown. Uh, people it's like, so now that you finally accomplished that goal, what, what are you going to do? I mean, are you sad? I'm like, no, no, no sadness. <laughs> I am thrilled. I am overjoyed. That is done. That was cool. That was a lifelong mission. I did it. And now I can do whatever I want. I don't have to worry about whether or not I get hurt because it gets got kind of nerve wracking. You know, if I get hurt, you know, when you run that much, you tend to get hurt. Runners are always hurt. And I just needed to knock out these states. Yeah. So now I'm since then, I've run two ultras, 131 miles, 132 miles. Um, I got Berlin in September. Um, no, I'm not going to run one in every country or continent just, <laughs> that's what i was thinking I no no it's just whatever happens there's yeah. nothing out there i want to do you know my ultimate race would be comrades marathon in south africa it's actually a 56 mile race and it's in you you run from point to point one year it's downhill the next year it's uphill yeah um so that's my ultimate bucket list race but there's nothing out there i just want to do if something pops up i mean i could get off this call with you and and someone can say, hey, there's this crazy race this weekend. You want to do it? And I'm like, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> Up for anything. Well, yeah. Paul, uh, your story is so inspiring. And just what I love about this is, you know, I'm I'm looking at somebody that from my perspective is just doing what he loves. You know, running is something that you're passionate about, the travel, the family. And, and to me, it really is like, you know, you're doing something that is seemingly for you, but it's really, it was for your family and it was for others. And now like we're getting to share your story. And I know that this story is going to inspire other people because this is something that, you know, you're showing people it's achievable. And so to me, this is really about turning, turning a passion into purpose. And I, you know, I wish we had another uh, podcast episode that we can do because the things that you're doing, like destination marathons and let me run these organizations that are helping and serving other people to get after their goals and dreams and to become the best versions of themselves. It's super inspiring. And I really appreciate the work that you're doing and, and just, you know, being who you are and inspiring other people. I do want to ask you, you know, for, from a standpoint of a lifelong journey, whether it's a lifelong goal or just, you know, any goal that maybe it's only, you know, a month to accomplish or six months, like what advice do you have for people that, you know, have maybe thought about going after some goal, no matter how big it is, um, but maybe experience some resistance to going after it? What, what would be your advice to those folks? See, my goal was different because it was, you know, it wasn't just one thing. It was, it was a accumulation of things, but whatever that goal is, you know, have a plan, have a loose plan, have an idea and don't get discouraged. Like, like I said earlier, you know, failure is only failure. If you fail to try again, mm. you just, you just keep going after it. And uh, when something sets you back, figure out, don't stop at that point. That's not a stopping point. That's a pause. Yeah. Um, and then you can press the play button again and keep going. Um, yeah. 
just figure out what you can do to adjust the plan to move forward. You know, a little bit at a time, patience, patience is what you need. And your example of Boston was a great example because you talked about how like that one that towards the end, like not qualifying that one time allowed you to pivot and get after your end goal even faster. So it was right. like, you know, not getting too attached to the outcome for you allowed you to pivot and, and get back after the, the uh, end goal in the first place. Everything happens for a reason. And, uh, and I'm glad I did not get into Boston that year. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. So, I mean, this, th this lifetime of running this goal and all of the, uh, all of this turning passion into purpose, Hollywood's going to make a movie about you someday, <laughs> Paul. And I, and I want to know who the actor is going to be that's going to play you. Well, first of all, I want to say, you know, you say ordinary people do extraordinary, extraordinary things. Well, I'm glad that I'm part of this uh, podcast because I am ordinary. I've heard your other podcasts and those are some extraordinary people. So I'm glad I can bring ordinary to your podcast. We're all, um, we're all ordinary in our own ways. We're all extraordinary and ordinary at the same time. So uh, yeah, that movie, funny thing. I don't know what it could be called. Something like my own path or something. And then with the subtitle, seeing America 26 miles at a time. Ooh, love that. And then, so here's a funny thing. So I mentioned this to my family, uh, who should play me in the movie. And my daughter said, Matthew McConaughey, because she knows, my whole family knows, I absolutely hate the guy. <laughs> and <laughs> okay. I don't know why I Fair hate enough. him. I don't really hate him. Fair I'm just, enough. you know, I just don't, you know, I don't Keep jive it. with him. Keep your enemies close, they say. So yeah. Gonna, so Matthew McConaughey is going to play. I think I think he would portray you very well. He actually wrote a book recently um, called Green Lights. It was pretty good. You, it's about adventure. You probably would like it. Maybe you'd All like right. more if you read the book. Maybe. Yeah, I need to read that book because I have some negative energy that I need to get rid of. I don't okay, need there that you go. Energy. That holds you back. So my wife says Phil Dumphy, you know, from Modern Family. Oh, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. The goofy dad who tries yep. to be cool because yep. when growing up, we all watched the show and I was always referenced to be Phil Dunphy. But, uh, well, I have a confession because uh, Phil Dunphy, uh, Ty Burrell is that actor and he's mine yeah. too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you're the goofy dad too? Uh, absolutely. 100%. All right. It's good to be the goofy dad. So when you, when you, uh, well, I knew you were going to ask me that question. My first answer in my mind is I have to play me. Yes. Nobody can play me because nobody knows when you go for a run, it's a magical experience. The endorphins kick in. Yes. You think better. You think clearer. It calms you down. There's so medical, so many medical purposes of running. And so much happens on the run with my friends, the conversations we have. And each race and each event is so meaningful for me and like dedicating like a certain mile to someone. I don't know how someone could portray that other than me. But if someone had to play me, it could be Jared Leto since he did oh, play, he played the most legendary American runner of all time. He played Steve Prefontaine. Ah, there Not you go. Not that I am anything close to pre. There you go. But, and I didn't realize Jared is 50 years old. He does not look that old. He doesn't, no. So huh? he could play young Paul and old Paul. He's a great actor. I love yeah. it. Well, Paul, thank you so <laughs> much for sharing this awesome story with us. And for those listening, I hope you've been inspired today as much as I have. I hope Paul's story has encouraged you to listen to the voice inside that calls you to adventure because we want to hear your story next. If you have a story to tell or you need a nudge to create one, please send me an email. We'd also appreciate it if you'd help us spread the word by leaving a review and sharing or tagging Inspire Campfire in your social media. And until next time, I want to encourage you to get outside. Thank you for listening. Paul, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Scott.